History That Doesn't Suck is a bi-weekly podcast delivering a legit, seriously researched, hard-hitting survey of American history through entertaining stories. To keep up with History That Doesn't Suck news, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you'd like to help keep the podcast going or enjoy some of the extras we offer, please consider giving at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. And if you enjoy today's episode, be sure to check out our other podcast, History That Doesn't Suck presents Office Hours with Greg, where Ciel, Josh, and I will discuss it in depth, go behind the scenes, and take your questions. Welcome to History That Doesn't Suck. I'm your professor, Greg Jackson, and I'd like to tell you a story. Vive la réforme! A pas guiso! The Parisian crowd screams as they throw rocks through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs windows. They cling to their sticks and iron bars, wanting to get past the fence and guards so they can exact their vengeance on Guizot. If they manage to get in this building, there'll be hell to pay. I know, this isn't what you were expecting. Here's what's going on. We're in Paris, 1848, where the French feel a great sense of ennui toward King Louis-Philippe. As a moderate constitutional monarchist, that is, a king kept in check by a parliament, Louis-Philippe is too liberal for the aristocrats, but he's also too conservative for most of the working and middle classes. Now, he's not a terrible monarch. The economy's gone through a rough patch, but things are getting better, and the king isn't oppressive. But this is an extremely limited constitutional monarchy that only lets the super wealthy haute bourgeoisie vote. So many of France's educated, comfortable middle class have spent the last year protesting their lack of enfranchisement by holding banquets where they make toasts to more Republican ideas. They'd planned such a banquet in Paris for today, February 22nd, 1848, which, by the way, is George Washington's birthday. But the French government shut it down. Hence the angry citizens. And their fury is aimed particularly at the man whose answer to their calls for voting reform has simply been, Enrichissez-vous. That is to say, if you want to vote, quote, make yourself rich. Close quote. That man would be King Louis-Philippe's trusted, beloved minister, François Guizot. Hence the call, à bas Guizot, meaning, down with Guizot and vive la réforme, meaning long live reform, which is a reference to reforming and expanding the vote. But the crowd's not going to get a chance to harm Guizot. Soon, a unit of bayonet-bearing guards march out and menacingly take a position opposite the crowd. They grab one of the rioters. The crowd seizes a guardsman in return and rough him up. Thankfully, there's no further escalation here, but crowds and violence are bubbling up everywhere. Riders smash all the lamps along the Champs-Élysées. Parisians are seizing chairs, horse-drawn omnibuses, and pretty much anything they can get their hands on, then using them to barricade the streets. Not that we should be surprised by this. I mean, barricading the streets is kind of the official pastime of 19th century Paris. More seriously, though, barricades are going up left and right. Rue 29 Juillet, Rue de Rivoli. Rue Saint-Henri, Rue du Temple, Rue Saint-Martin. All of these streets and others across Paris are now middle and working class defensive positions. Using sticks, bars, you name it, Parisians are also ripping up the pavement to arm themselves with stones. Municipal guards alternately succeed and fail to drive the stone-slinging, sometimes gun or sword-wielding defenders from the various barricades as the night comes on. With blood drawn, death spreading across Paris, and continued cries of Vive la réforme! A bas guizot! The protest has transformed into a full-on insurrection. The next day, Wednesday, February 23rd, King Louis-Philippe's situation grows worse. He still has loyal units, true, but the National Guard is defecting. One National Guard artillery officer close to the Hôtel de Ville is reported to have said, Fire on the people! No, fire on the people who pay us. We shall do nothing of the kind. 
If we have to choose between massacring our brothers and abandoning the monarchy, there can be no hesitation. Wow. Louis-Philippe relents. That afternoon, he dismisses Guizot. The Parisians wonder, though, can they really trust this king? Won't he just recall Guizot the moment this all ends? The violence calms, but the people do not abandon their barricades. Some radicals are even emboldened by the news. It's now evening. A crowd is gathered in front of Guizot's residence. Unarmed students and artisans sing Mourir pour la patrie as the 14th Regiment of Line stands guard. Then suddenly, a gun discharges. Mistaking the accidental misfire for an attack, the 14th Colonel orders his well-trained men to engage. They quickly aim their rifles into the crowd and fire. I can't describe the outcome of this attack better than the English journalist in Paris during all this, Percy St. John, so I'll let him tell it. To quote him, The scene which followed was awful. Thousands of men, women, children, shrieking, bawling, raving were seen flying in all directions, while 62 men, women, and lads, belonging to every class of society, lay weltering in their blood upon the pavement. A squadron of cuirassiers now charged, sword in hand over dead and wounded, amid useless cries of, Mind the fallen! and drove the people before them. The sight was awful. Husbands were seen dragging their fainting wives from the scene of massacre. Fathers snatching up their children with pale faces and clenched teeth hurried away to put their young ones in safety and then to come out in arms against the monarchy. Close quote. As a conscientious historian, let me note that other sources say 52 rather than Percy's reported 62 people died. Either way, the king's men have just mowed down over 50 people. With the massacre over, opposition parliamentarian Monsieur de Courte approaches the colonel. Monsieur, he says, you have committed an action unworthy of a French soldier. Racked with guilt, the colonel explains his mistake in thinking his men were under attack. Sympathetic but shrewd, Monsieur de Courte replies, Monsieur le colonel, you are a soldier. I believe in your good faith, but remember, that an awful responsibility rests on your head. Awful responsibility indeed. This slaughter galvanizes the rebels, turning the insurrection into France's third revolution since 1789. King Louis-Philippe abdicates and flees to England the next day as the people establish the Second French Republic. As much as I enjoyed having an excuse to use my French again, we're not going to hang out in Paris today. Sorry. France's revolution of 1848 is, however, a great example of the cries for social and democratic reform that are sweeping across mid-19th century Europe and the United States. We've heard about the era's growing interest in abolishing slavery and how that's exacerbating the conflict between the North and South in the last few episodes. Today, we're going to hit a few more of these burgeoning social reform movements, like public education and temperance. More particularly, though, we're focusing on America's nascent women's rights movement. We'll get to know Elizabeth Cady Stanton and follow her from childhood up through organizing and hosting the first American Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848. And hey, we'll bring the French back into it. Our new friend Frederick Douglass will reference this revolution later in the episode. Just wait for it. So... Ready to explore mid-19th century America's growing conscience despite its impending civil war? Excellent. Then let's go back to upstate New York in the year 1815 so we can bond with Elizabeth and follow her path from disappointing her father to fierce women's suffrage crusader. Rewind. The elegant, white frame home of Judge Daniel Cady sits in the square of the small, 200 miles north of NYC Hamlet, that is Johnstown, New York. Its shuttered windows look directly across the green to the county courthouse. The socially conservative, traditional Katie household consists of the judge, his wife, Margaret, their three surviving children, four nursemaids, and several servants. But the Katies add a little girl to their large brood on November 12, 1815. Elizabeth Katie is the fifth baby girl to join the family and grows up with the many privileges that her father and mother can offer. 
Life sails along pretty quietly for the dark-haired, round-faced girl and her siblings until she's 10. On August 26th, 1826, Elizabeth's oldest and only living brother, Eliezer, dies at the age of 20 after a prolonged and painful battle with an unknown illness. As you can imagine, the Katy family is devastated as they host a viewing in their spacious sitting room before the formal church funeral. Young Elizabeth is completely heartbroken, but her dad, Daniel, is despondent. After the black-clad mourners and guests leave, the judge sits in an armchair, staring into space, contemplating the loss of his only son and heir. She may be growing up, but 10-year-old Elizabeth is still enough of a child to sit on her dad's knee. So the young girl climbs onto his lap and lays her head on his chest. And what happens next will forever be sealed into her memory. To quote her, My father heaved a deep sigh and said, Oh, my daughter, I wish you were a boy. Throwing my arms around his neck, I replied, I will try to be all my brother was. Close quote. And the determined girl means it. Years will pass before she realizes that she will never please her father because, try as she might, she never can be a boy. Nevertheless, Elizabeth figures that the best way to try to fill her brother's shoes is to be as educated as he was. So the very next day, Elizabeth starts to learn Greek. But well versed in Greek or not, there aren't a lot of education and career options open to Elizabeth. Unable to go to the all-boy Union College as her brother had done before his early death, she graduates from Johnstown Academy at 16 and goes to Troy Female Seminary to get a teaching certificate. After graduating, Elizabeth returns home to Johnstown and starts spending a little time with her brother-in-law. And by a little, I mean a lot. Yeah, so they totally fall in love. Elizabeth will later recall this time as, quote, the period when love in soft silver tones whispers his first words of adoration, painting our graces and virtue day by day in living colors, in poetry and prose, stealthily punctuated even and anon with a kiss or fond embrace. Close quote. Now I can't tell you whether they are physically involved or not, but after reading that quote, I think we can agree that her talent as a writer shines far more when she's writing about politics than matters of the heart. But this humanizing anecdote aside, this is a time when already studious Elizabeth starts thinking yet another layer deeper and gets involved in the social issues swirling all around her. I already told you about the abolition movement that gains traction in the 1830s, but reformers are fighting for other social issues as well. Public education, prison and asylum reform, and temperance. As transcendentalist writer Ralph Waldo Emerson observes, quote, In the history of the world, the doctrine of reform had never such scope as at the present hour. Close quote. In fact, before we continue with Elizabeth's story, let me break down just how hard these social reform movements are hitting the United States. At this point, both sides of the political spectrum, the Whigs and the Democrats, are down with publicly funding schools to educate all children. Now, I know you're used to this in the 21st century, but I need you to understand that this is a crazy new idea. Right now, in the mid-19th century, most children anywhere in the world do not have access to an education. The impulse here in the United States is driven, at least in part, by republicanism. Increasingly, Americans are realizing that, well, to be blunt, if all these kids, okay, boys, are going to grow up and vote, then it would help if they aren't dumb as bricks. One Ohio newspaper editor makes this point by writing, quote, Other nations have hereditary sovereigns, and one of the most important duties of their governments is to take care of the education of the heir to the throne. These children all about your streets are your future sovereigns. Close quote. But it's not just about preparing children to engage in government decisions. Education reformers also hope to build children's character and improve the conditions of the poor. New York Governor William Seward insists, quote, Education tends to produce equality, not by leveling all to the condition of the base, but by elevating all to the association of the wise and good. Close quote. In order to realize their goals, reformers recruit women as teachers. Not only can these educated in the basics young women teach morals and arithmetic at the same time, but economy-minded politicians realize female educators 
cost about 60% less than their male counterparts. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear this incongruity in compensation will help fuel women's rights down the road, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. You'll hear about that after we circle back to Elizabeth. Beyond education, other social reformers look to problems plaguing state-run prisons and asylums. Dorothea Dix notices that asylums, think mental institutions, are often run like prisons with shockingly inhumane treatment of inmates too mentally ill to stand up for themselves. Dorothea and like-minded reformers travel the country urging state legislators to pass reforms mandating, quote, moral treatment, close quote, of the mentally ill and insane in asylums that are clean, safe, and nurturing. While a lot of people can get behind educating kids and treating the mentally ill with kindness, the party-killing temperance crusaders come on the scene like a bucket of cold water. Literally, they hold cold water picnics where the only beverage is cold water. Come on, guys. The founding fathers would not be okay with this. Considering that Alexander Hamilton's doctor once instructed him to, quote, indulge in wine sparingly, never go beyond three glasses, close quote, and to otherwise not have wine every single day, Temperance definitely shows America is changing. Okay, that said, temperance reformers make some pretty compelling points. They point out that some men spend their rent money on hard drinks, like whiskey, then take their drunken aggression out on their wives and children. After that, these overindulgers show up for work late and hungover. Women and employers are fed up. By 1835, the American Society for the Promotion of Temperance has 1.5 million members. This far exceeds the 250,000 members in the American Anti-Slavery Society, and these teetotalers are making real inroads on curbing alcohol consumption. They persuade the U.S. Army to put the kibosh on its age-old liquor ration in 1832. In fact, due in large part to the reformers' efforts, annual alcohol intake per adult drops from 3.9 gallons to 1.8 gallons across the 1830s. Many of the members of these social improvement groups, public schooling, asylum reforms, or temperance, are women. Since they can't vote, the only way for them to affect a necessary social and political change is to join a reform society, sign a petition, or subscribe to a reform newspaper. For instance, women like extremely outspoken Abby Kelly, brilliant Quaker minister Lucretia Mott, and the slave owners turned Quaker abolitionist sisters, Angelina and Sarah Grimke, all lend their time and expertise to the abolitionist and temperance movements in the 1830s. They are ardent in their work, and not ones to be pushed around. Let me give you an example. On May 14, 1838, South Carolina-born Quaker convert Angelina Grimke marries abolitionist Theodore Weld in Philly. The wedding guests including black and white men and women, observe the Quaker-inspired wedding ceremony, which conspicuously omits the words, quote, to honor and obey, close quote, from the vows. If the diverse guest list doesn't rile the city's more close-minded population, Angelina's honeymoon plans definitely do. Instead of jetting off to the Caribbean like we might in the 21st century, Though to be fair, you might be hard-pressed to find a Sandals resort in Jamaica in 1838. Angelina attends an integrated meeting of the Anti-Slavery Convention of American Women. And this isn't just any meeting. It's a well-planned and well-attended three-day event with Abby Kelly and Lucretia Mott as keynote speakers hosted in the brand new Pennsylvania Hall. Okay, Now it's making a little more sense why Angelina would spend her first day as a married woman at this event instead of lounging on the deck of a not-yet-existing cruise ship. Anyway, the large brick Pennsylvania Hall with imposing Greek columns flanking its front doors was built at a cost of over $40,000 and boasts gas lighting and a modern blue and white interior paint scheme. The black and white women admire the craftsmanship of the building as the meeting begins on Tuesday, May 15th. However, this integrated gathering is way too much, as they call it, quote, amalgamation, close quote, for many Philadelphians. Sure, they may live in the city of brotherly love, but like-minded black and white women gathering together to discuss ways to end slavery? That's taking it too far. As Abby Kelly takes the podium to open the convention, a large mob, possibly consisting of several thousand people, 
surrounds the building during the meeting, shouting threats at the women inside. But indomitable Abby won't be shouted down. She continues her speech over the din of rocks and bricks, hitting the outer walls and even a few windows. I have never before addressed a promiscuous assembly, nor is it now the maddening rush of those voices, nor the crashing of those windows, the indication of a moral earthquake that calls me before you. But it is the still small voice within which may not be withstood that bids me open my mouth for the dumb, that bids me plead the cause of God's perishing poor. Abby shouts over the noise. The president of the Pennsylvania Hall asks for police protection, though probably to save the new building more than to protect the convention attendees. But no help is coming. The mayor refuses, claiming that the forward-thinking women brought this mess on themselves. Damn, that's cold. And cruel. To avoid injury, the women decide to adjourn the meeting early and leave the hall arm-in-arm, black and white, protecting themselves from the incensed crowd. And they do make it home unscathed, but the hall isn't as lucky. The huge mob is intent on preventing such an inclusive meeting from happening again. So, on May 17, 1838, they break into the hall, pile up papers for kindling, open the gas jets, and set the place on fire. The large, modern, comfortable building is gutted within a few hours. Not satiated, the hyped-up, out-of-control mob vandalizes a nearby church and orphanage for black children. But I told you, these strong, devoted women won't let anything get in the way of having their voices heard. The resourceful abolitionists find a nearby schoolhouse and hold the rest of their convention there. After the days-long convention ends, Lucretia Mott sums it up, saying that the, quote, rich feast was not seriously interrupted even by the burning of the hall. Close quote. Well, if an angry mob burning down their meeting hall doesn't phase Lucretia, nothing can. So now that you've gotten a taste of what these tough-as-nails mid-century reformers are like, let's return to our friend Elizabeth Cady. She's getting involved in all sorts of social reform movements. Temperance. Abolition. Basically, she's like a kid in a candy shop. Everything looks good. And despite her high social status and traditional upbringing, Elizabeth leans socialist. Now, please understand that socialism as an ideology is still very much developing. I mean, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels are still young men who've yet to make their mark. So I'd think twice before pigeonholing her into a modern concept of socialism. That said, she is definitely concerned about financial inequality. In arguing for social reforms, she expresses her belief that, quote, the few have no right to the luxuries of life while the many are denied its necessities, close quote. Elizabeth finds a like-minded partner in a well-known, staunch abolitionist fellow named Henry Stanton, and they marry on May 1, 1840. The couple's honeymoon destination of London sounds a lot more conventional than Angelina Grimke's, but don't worry, it really isn't. Rather than ride the London Eye or take the Channel to Paris, okay, to be fair, those things don't exist yet, they attend the World Anti-Slavery Convention. This is an international abolitionist coalition, and Henry is a delegate. I know, these people are super admirable, but they need to learn how to take a decent vacation. Anyway, eight American women have also received invitations to participate in this international convention, including Lucretia Mott, who is currently on the board of directors of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. Lucretia and Elizabeth immediately hit it off. Despite their 20-year age difference, they find common ground in their passion for social reform. The convention gets underway the first week of June, 1840. Now, you might think that every abolitionist, man or woman, American or European, would be thrilled to have dedicated women like Elizabeth and Lucretia on their team. But this is 1840. Many men and women cannot accept the idea of women entering the public sphere. This is partly because a woman who speaks publicly to a group that includes men is often thought to be sexually promiscuous. Following that line of thinking, there's no way the men attending this London convention are going to let women participate. So even though these American women are invited delegates and have sailed across an ocean to be here, 90% of the male delegates at the convention vote to exclude all women from participating in the proceedings. The female attendees have to sit in a small, 
curtained off room where they can hear but not see the proceedings. Not much of a consolation prize for these capable, committed women. Elizabeth and Lucretia are irate at this blatant sexist discrimination. They've been instrumental, powerful forces for good in the temperance and abolition movements back in the United States for years, and now they can't even sit in the same room as the men, let alone make a speech or two. This is the last straw. These women won't be fenced in or excluded on the basis of sex anymore. After the convention ends, Elizabeth and Lucretia walk back to their hotel and, Elizabeth tells us, they, quote, resolved to hold a convention as soon as we returned home, close quote. After all, they've been fighting for improved schools, more humane prisons and asylums, temperance, and abolition. But who's fighting for them? Elizabeth knows it's time to make some serious changes. She notes the incident at the World Anti-Slavery Convention caused a, quote, burning indignation that filled my soul, close quote. She goes on to tell Lucretia, quote, the more I think on the present condition of woman, the more am I oppressed with the reality of her degradation. The laws of our country, how unjust are they? Our customs, how vicious, close quote. Unfortunately, once Elizabeth is back in the States, politics and the demands of family life get in the way of putting a woman's convention together immediately. Remember, as we heard back in episode 39, the Liberty Party is making significant political headway in the 1840s. They really don't want any other cause to distract from abolition and their members push back hard against women's rights. Also, newly married Elizabeth has three children in quick succession. She calls her frequent pregnancies, quote, her biennial attacks, close quote, and finds herself in the thick of caring for young children without the help of her often on the road husband. But two things happen in 1848 that bring Elizabeth's idea of a women's rights convention back to the forefront. The first one you heard about in the episode's opening. That's right, the French Revolution of 1848. French demands for increased suffrage rekindle Elizabeth's ideals. And this revolt isn't the only European political and social uprising of the 1840s. Not by a long shot. In England, the Chartists are demanding broader male suffrage. Austria, Prussia, and the Italian states are also experiencing political upheaval as the people call for democratizing overhauls. Americans definitely feel the shockwaves from this European upheaval, which only invigorates the reform movements already in play in the U.S. Accounts and descriptions of the 1848 French Revolution reach America's shores in the early spring of that year, and Frederick Douglass writes in his reformist and forward-looking paper, The North Star, quote, Thanks to steam navigation and electric wires, a revolution now cannot be confined to the place or the people where it may commence, but flashes with lightning speed from heart to heart, from land to land, till it has traversed the globe, compelling all members of our common brotherhood at once to pass judgment upon its merits. The revolution in France, like a bolt of living thunder, has aroused the world from its stupor. Close quote. But closer to home, we have the second thing that's resurrecting Elizabeth's long-dreamt-of convention, the newly enacted New York Married Women's Property Act. This April 1848 law allows married women to retain ownership of any and all property that she may bring into a marriage and claim any other property they may acquire during the marriage. This is a big leap forward for women's rights, since law had previously enforced the idea that a woman became the property of her husband as part of marriage and therefore couldn't own property. In arguing against the Women's Property Act, Representative Christian Knave threatens, quote, If we establish the principle that the pecuniary interest of women is separate and distinct from that of men, we should establish also their right of representation and their right of suffrage. It would be but just, and their separate interest should be represented. Close quote. Now, again, don't misunderstand Christian here. He is not advocating for women's rights. In fact, he's painting what he considers a dire picture, claiming that if women get to own property, they must have a vote and a rep in Congress. No taxation without representation, right? And since Christian can't stomach women's suffrage, he definitely doesn't want female property rights. 
Nonetheless, where he and like-minded men detect a threat, Elizabeth sees an opportunity. On July 9, 1848, Elizabeth attends a Sunday tea with her old friends Lucretia Mott, Martha Wright, and Mary Ann McClintock at Jane Hunt's Waterloo, New York house. They discuss the new Property Rights Act and the plight of women in general. Elizabeth, who's in the thick of raising children, running a household, and recovering from a difficult miscarriage while her husband travels the abolitionist lecture circuit, vents her frustrations to her friends. The general discontentment I feel with women's portion as wife, mother, housekeeper, physician, and spiritual guide, and the wearied, anxious look of the majority of women impress me with a strong feeling that some active measures should be taken to remedy wrongs, of women in particular. Close quote. She doesn't just talk the talk, she walks the walk. Her problems are the problems of most women who, no matter their talents or abilities, are stuck in a box by cultural values, social structure, and unfair laws with no way out because they have no power. To put that another way, Elizabeth wants to change society so that fathers don't have to wish away their daughters like hers did when she was 10. It's time to act. Elizabeth later remembers that, quote, we decided to hold a convention at once while Mrs. Mott was with us in central New York. Close quote. Lucretia lives in Philadelphia and will be traveling home soon, so they need to act fast. That night, the women set a date, find a location, and write up an ad for their convention. The ad first runs in the Seneca County Courier on Tuesday, July 11th, and gets picked up by several other local papers. Okay, now that they've gotten the word out, it's time to invite some speakers and write up their list of grievances. Elizabeth McClintock asks Angelina and Sarah Grimke to attend the convention, but doesn't ever hear from them. However, she does get known abolitionist and women's rights advocate Frederick Douglass to speak at the meeting. After all, since the masthead of his newspaper declares, quote, Right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren, close quote. There's no way he's going to miss the first American Women's Rights Convention. Lucretia, of course, will be the keynote speaker. And while they prep their remarks, Elizabeth sits down with McClintock. Sorry for the last name. Just wanted to make sure I didn't lose you, since she has the same name as our main protagonist. And they make an agenda for the convention while writing up their proposed resolutions. Elizabeth may be the force behind this whole convention, but she has never put together an event like this and feels way out of her depth until she lands on a game-changing idea. Elizabeth decides to rework the Declaration of Independence into a, quote, declaration of sentiments, close quote, that would list the grievances not of colonial subjects against a king, but of women against their, quote, sires and sons, close quote. Her edited preamble reads, in part, to quote again, When a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of the women under their government, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they are entitled. Close quote. The Declaration of Sentiments goes on to list 16 grievances, and right out the gate, Elizabeth goes after the vote. Quote, he has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. Close quote. But bold and nationally respected Lucretia worries that demanding women's suffrage will bring ridicule on the convention. Yeah, she wasn't bothered by a Philadelphia mob throwing rocks and bricks through the windows during an integrated women's abolitionist convention, but demanding suffrage might be going too far. That gives you an idea of how extreme Elizabeth's words are for the era. Nonetheless, Lucretia agrees to leave the bold statement in the declaration. However, Elizabeth's husband, Henry, who is not at all sympathetic to his wife's cause, tells her, quote, you will turn the proceedings into a farce, close quote. Way to be supportive and cheer your wife on, Henry. He doesn't attend the convention. Instead, he travels to Canandaigua to give an abolition lecture. With the declaration and resolutions written and the guest speakers lined up, Elizabeth and her compatriots are ready to get this long-awaited convention started. 
However, when they show up at the Wesleyan Church of Seneca Falls, the only building in town that would agree to host them, on Wednesday, July 19th, 1848, the church is locked. In their haste to put on this meeting, pick up building keys didn't end up on anyone's to-do list. Luckily, Elizabeth's young nephew, Daniel Eaton, who is attending with his mom, Harriet, climbs through a window and unlocks the door for everyone. On this first day of the convention, only women are invited to attend. However, a few women without ready access to childcare, like Harriet, bring their kids and a few men sit in the back as well. The organizers proceed anyway. The first item of business is to read and vote on the Declaration of Sentiments, its grievances, and the 11 accompanying resolutions. Elizabeth is so nervous when she stands to read the documents that she feels like, quote, abandoning all her principles and running away, close quote. Of course, the determined social reformer believes too much in the cause to do that. The grievances and most of the resolutions pass unanimously, without a word of dissent. I can't confirm this, but I'm betting that every teacher's head in the room nods when Elizabeth reads the grievance, quote, He has monopolized nearly all the profitable employments, and from those she is permitted to follow, she receives but a scanty remuneration. Close quote. I'm also putting money down that every hand in the church goes up when Elizabeth asks for a vote on the third resolution, which declares, Resolved that woman is man's equal, was intended to be so by the Creator, and the highest good of the race demands that she should be recognized as such. Close quote. But the ninth resolution, which calls for women's suffrage, gets a different reaction. This one scares most women. Let's face it, if Lucretia is worried, so is everyone else. They don't want to be laughed at. But Elizabeth insists. She determinedly, quote, urges the women of the country to secure to themselves the elective franchise, close quote. Even with staunch opposition from her husband and many others, she demands suffrage, quote, because I saw that was the fundamental right out of which all others should necessarily flow, close quote. Her perseverance pays off and the resolution passes. After the vote, Lucretia gives a moving speech on progress and the meeting adjourns for the day. On the second day, men are official guests. They even have Lucretia's husband, James, preside. After lunch, Elizabeth reads the Declaration of Sentiments again. And again, some people want to debate the suffrage clause. The women's voting crusader isn't sure she can stand up to the naysayers on her own, though, so she asks Frederick Douglass to give a speech backing her up. He does. If you listen to episode 38, then you know what a powerful orator Frederick is. He stands at the pulpit and declares that, quote, The power to choose rulers and make laws was the right by which all others could be secured. He goes on to argue that women must have this right. Nonetheless, while she listens to Frederick's words, Elizabeth realizes she has a lot more to add. Nerves now gone, completely overshadowed by confidence and zeal for her cause, the reformer says, quote, The first thing I knew, I was on my feet defending the resolution, and in due time, Frederick and I carried the whole convention. Close quote. Resolution 9 and its demand for women's suffrage passes. Before the convention closes, attendees sign the Declaration of Sentiments and the 11 resolutions. Of the approximately 300 people at the meeting, 68 women put their stamp of approval on it. 32 men, including Frederick Douglass, sign a separate list. The first women's rights convention is a complete success. Elizabeth, not one for understatement, concludes that the convention sparks, quote, a rebellion such as the world had never before seen, close quote. It also sparks other conventions. Only two weeks after the Seneca Falls meeting, women gather in Rochester, New York, to discuss their rights. And the movement just keeps growing through the 1850s, with convention after convention being held all over the North. Frankly, Elizabeth is just getting started. She and her future friend, Susan B. Anthony, will later found the National Woman Suffrage Association. So this isn't the last we'll hear from Elizabeth, and Susan will certainly get her day in the sun too. But that day isn't today. A storm is brewing that overshadows them. It's out west, in a place now being called Kansas. Bleeding Kansas. History That Doesn't Suck is supported by fans at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. 
Josh, Ciel, and I are beyond grateful to you kind souls providing funding to help us keep going. Thank you. And a special thanks to our patrons, whose monthly gift puts them at producer status. Will Caldwell, Jason Carstens, and Dex Jones. And if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to check out History That Doesn't Suck Presents Office Hours with Greg for more discussion. Join me in two weeks, where I'd like to tell you a story.